Hey everybody, welcome back to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 681, being recorded on June 15, 2022. I'm Sebastian Peek. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Brett Van Spronberg. And I'm Kent Burgess. Not Josh Walrath, you can tell almost immediately because... Well, I mean, just because... There's no uh, Ripper XL box. That's probably what's the tip off. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, X XL. I'm left on an X. Mm-hmm. You can support this at patreon.com slash PC per become a patron. Put your name here, literally right here and a lower third. I'll use your name instead of mine. You can make it something really obnoxious and insulting to me. And I will proudly... You know, I, I will sell myself to the highest bidder is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Normally, at this time, we would go to Laramie, Wyoming. But as you can see, Josh abandoned us this week. He's on assignment. He's unavailable. So, you know, this is Josh. <laughs> Virtual Josh. Do, do you it's have a much burger? much warmer here Kids? than it is in Laramie. Actually, it's we have warmer uh, here. we have a James Pryor caveman gem. Yeah. On Twitter. Cave Man Jam is, you know, at least as important as Josh, if not more. Ate a burger and onion rings yesterday. It doesn't matter. Look at the nice photography, too. Look how soft the... What what kind of a camera is this? Did he use a, a real camera, or is this just the best I think he might have. It says Twitter for iPhone. Is This is an iPhone uh, image? I'm impressed. It is. Look at that burger. It's nice. It's incredible. It's, it's photogenic. It's I don't know tall. about these spring greens or whatever this is. <laughs> You're supposed to eat more leafy greens, so give me real. You just name. shove them in things with your with your triple bacon and uh, cheese. Yeah. It still counts as having eaten the f- fresh dark greens. This part here, right here, looks like a BLT. That's great. I'm guessing there's yep. a burger patty under here somewhere. You can see I a little like bit of it right there. The cheese, yes. And like it's a how lightly weighted... toasted bun, which well, I appreciate. Yeah, I like how the weight of it all is sinking into the bun. Nice. Okay. A burger moment this week. Mm-hmm. From Caveman Jim. Our top story tonight has to be uh, some of the news that AMD provided just after our last podcast, including the revelation that RDNA 3 GPUs feature a chiplet architecture. That's right. They're not just going down to 5 nanometer. They're not just enhanced. It's not just a die shrink. It's re-architected. We're talking about the same groundbreaking chiplet architecture that AMD introduced five years ago with the Ryzen processors. I will say more obvious things that everybody already knows. <laughs> and here's the other thing. This is the crazy thing. Look at the bottom of this image. It says coming later this year. They're not just announcing what? this for the future. They're announcing that, oh yeah, the next GPUs, they're uh, chiplets. It's not a drill. Chiplets are coming to GPUs. And they're projecting a performance per watt uplift from RDNA 2 to RDNA 3 of over 50%. Hmm. How does that move Sli- you? Slightly dubious on that right now. What do you mean? <laughs> they have re-architected they- the compute units. They have optimized the graphics pipeline. This is kind of like uh, what they did with RDNA over GCN. And we have a next-gen Infinity Cache, which I'm assuming has to handle the workload of uh, you know interconnecting the chiplets, perhaps. Will it work like Infinity Fabric? Will there be more Infinities? Yeah, if you look at their process roadmap, they show that from the 7 nanometer RDNA 2, they moved down to 5 nanometer with RDNA 3, which they're calling Navi 3X. And then next gen after that, RDNA 4 will be Navi 4X, and it will be on, quote, advanced node, end quote. So I don't know if that's a en- enhanced 5 nanometer or if that will actually be something smaller. I wonder if that's dependent upon availability at TSMC or what. But hey, it's coming probably late this year. Un- Un- unlike the NVIDIA 4000 series, which won't be coming soon. Well, hmm, this is probably sorry. all at the end of the year, I would guess. It's going It's going to be very interesting. I, it, I can't even get my head around how a chiplet design is going to work in a graphics application. You uh, mean, I mean sharing the going, load? Well, I, more of... Is it is it going to be functioning almost like SLI in in one unit basically? Or 
I, I'm pretty sure it, that the card will present itself as one entity and not an yeah. SLI style. Right. So well, especially well, they, they really doing want they won't call it SLI. No, yeah, certainly not. Or Crossfire, because that'll be confusing. Yes. They'll call it SLI Fire. But no, I mean, they, they're trying to take what used to be a workstation with fiber interconnects and then shrink it down until it's the size of, you know, a core. And well, I mean, there are inherent latencies in there, but at the same time, Infinity Fabric does do pretty good at getting rid of them. So, I mean, I think it's more a matter of it's just, it's significantly easier to do. You get much better yields out of it. And since you're working, you know, we're headed to four nanometer in no time at all, trying to get a four nanometer feature inside of a monolithic chip without, you know, that isn't uh, modular is, is going to be, you know, difficult. I think you just pointed out something that's kind of interesting and it's not necessarily a performance aspect to this is that it's a, it's a yield or a cost savings met, uh, yeah. method here in order to get better silicon uh, because you don't have to lay down as much in, in the area space. So how do you do this and still boost um, throughput and still boost output and do it in a cost-effective manner is that you start to hook more and more of these things together using your own proprietary interconnects and you divide the the chip and you logically the software workload where you can and then throw in your knowledge on how to do your interconnects the same way you did on your CPU, which always made sense for multi-core processing. That always made sense. It just doesn't make as much sense because we know that the pipelines that that generally run in GPUs don't have that natural per process divider that it was so easy to say, oh, well, that can belong to one CPU or that can belong to a different CPU or in AMD's case, different chiplets as they as the work got parceled out or as tasks got switched out and processes jump from one CPU to another. It, we aren't as familiar with how that might happen in the GPU world. And I, I think that's probably what Kent was trying to talk about as yes. well. Not yet, but exactly. I think it's going to yes. be the same thing. It makes perfect sense to do this on the CPU side of things, where if, especially if you're not in a workload that's Absolutely. especially latency dependent, yeah. then it doesn't matter. Like you're just the workload's going to take so long to complete. But with video, obviously, any kind of micro stutter. If this brings back mm -hmm. micro stutter, then it's going to put a lot of pressure on the driver team. How much parallelization is there in? The driver stack. Where the, I don't. I'm where not familiar the parallel, enough with the software to even understand this. Oh, it's Josh. We're here. Exactly. This week, exactly. Yeah, well, where's, how are you going to convince the people to program for it? Because mm -hmm. it's not going to be easy to program for, and then you're going to find new things in the new architecture, and some people are just going to say, "Yeah, whatever." Yeah. Will not RDNA these, three be like programming for the PlayStation three? Because then I think that will be a bit of a turn off. <laughs> not it's not, not a that sell. the video, not the video processing sells. can't be it parallelized. Two point <laughs> <laughs> that's mean but funny anyway this is a pretty good one and i look forward i look forward to seeing how this develops and as sebastian said it is very dependent on the software on how cool. they're going to take typical uh gpu instructions you know i say that loosely i don't mean that too literally down to like byte codes and stuff like that but how they decompose what a gpu does and internally parallelize that that workload into different chiplets and then share the output and stream that without stuttering. That'll be very, very interesting. This is where they need to have the media out to educate us and you know go to the little breakout sessions and explain the architecture mm -hmm. so that even someone like me can understand it. They just don't want you to know that they're actually going to only be running off of one chiplet. Yeah. Yeah, they're just <laughs> going to sit there like your multi-core CPU. Show. Just a show. <laughs> Well, we're not done talking about AMD because they had a lot to say during their financial mm -hmm. analyst day. Now, who knew that a meeting for analysts would have so much in the way of, you know, future roadmaps and interesting information about the upcoming GPUs, for example. But AMD had a lot more to talk about than just the GPUs adopting a chiplet architecture. And we can go past all the projections for shareholders and things and talk about the technology and product portfolio updates. These include information about Zen 4 CPU cores, which, as they say, will power the world's first high-performance 5 nanometer x86 CPUs later this year. They're finally giving us an IPC number. 8 to 10% IPC increase. I'll have to look at the footnote, but I'm assuming that is over Zen 3. 
and deliver more than a 25% increase in performance per watt and 35% overall performance increase compared to Zen 3 when running desktop applications. Another footnote. So many footnotes in here. The, there's some math uh, that, that doesn't work out in there where they're going saying an IPC increase of 8 to 10% um, and an overall increase of 35%, but they were showing... Uh, cores running at 5.5 gigahertz and they're saying 5.5 plus so if it's 8 to 10 percent per clock then you'd be looking at way more than 35 percent so there's there's some math in there that's um interesting let's look at footnotes the first footnote about ipc uplift it's based on the average of estimated slash published 2017 spec int and 2017 spec fp scores and internal estimates i like how they're using estimates testing on cinebench r23 single thread and geekbench 5 single thread for zen 4 and zen 3 processors so oh man you love we, we tested 5. it and then we estimated what we should have got so they tested the zen 3 and then they estimated the zen 4 is what i'm guessing because estimates yeah. comes before testing and then they mentioned zen 4 before zen 3 I don't like it. Yep. I don't like uh, projecting based on your estimates. What if you don't get the kind of performance that you want with the yields that you want and end up having a processor that's clocked like 200 megahertz slower and can't hit these numbers? Uh, results may vary when final products are released in market. Oh, boy. Yeah. So then... It says that at the end of almost all of the the cat's hair holes. Yeah, so... not, not final, uh, not final spec- yeah. specifications kind of thing. No. But don't worry, we're not lying to you, investors. It, it's totally feasible that this could be true. As long as they can hit the numbers that they showed on the stage, then in theory, mm-hmm. yeah. But is everything going to hit 5.5? And on how many cores? And for how long? I'll go back to this just for a moment. So Zen 5, it's coming in 2024, at least it's planned for 2024, which they say will be built from the ground up to deliver performance and efficiency leadership across a broad range of workloads and features and includes optimizations for AI and machine learning. Well, welcome to the party because that's Intel's strong point right now. They'd be good. I mean, they are adopting AVX 512 instructions with Zen 4. So there's they're building on that. And some other announcements. CDNA 3 architecture, which includes the 5 nanometer chiplets, 3D die stacking, fourth generation Infinity architecture, next generation Infinity cache technology, and HBM memory on a single package with a unified memory programming model. So that's going to be interesting for the data center, AI training see that, and workloads. See that foundational architectural IP from Xilinx? Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Key technologies, like including the, FPG yeah. fabric. Does that mean they'll actually have a chipset? Oh, no, I'm going to get killed for that. I know I am. Sorry. Yeah, you you deserve it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, in theory, that would make it a programmable, fi- uh, whatever you want to call it, infinity fabric, programmable mm-hmm. fabric, which would be interesting. In a bizarre side note, uh, I just saw some footnote someplace that um, there will be additional CPUs released on AM4. That doesn't surprise me at all. Mm. No. Look at what they okay. did with the refresh to the, what was it, the Ryzen 1600 AF? Right. That sort of thing. Enough about this theoretical stuff that's coming and speculating about its performance. Let's talk about something real that you can buy right now. We have photographic proof of this. Gunnear has an ARC graphics card. Intel ARC graphics are real. They are here. We have retail packaging. We Look at this. It's a real graphics card with a real box. It is an ARC A380. Photon OC. So, yeah, overclocked. Factory overclocked with two fans. Now, I don't know if you know the significance of this, but they are pumping this thing up from its stock 75 watt total board power to 92 yep and for some reason they need an eight pin to do this not sure why where six might have might have worked just fine fewer than six. i'm gonna go once again with it was cheaper for the it was already attached to the pcb and they're like yep it's I guess, cheaper, you know, really those handy. Molex connectors on graphics cards just aren't trendy anymore, but that's all that's really good. <laughs> and the please put them connector. in the middle. Please put them in the middle just like that. Mm, perfect. So, I mean, it's it sounds good. I, I have gotten to the point with this where I am 
pretty skeptical because it's all going to come down to the software. It's so driver dependent how these are going to perform against the competition. So even though we're hearing somewhere in the neighborhood of a translated roughly like $150 US price tag, it's not available here. This is China only. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about specs like 2000 megahertz clocks and up to 2450 maximum clock and 92 watt TDPs and... It's have, as you point out, it's not going to be comparable to our expected level of performance that similar cards have simply due to the lack of driver optimization mm -hmm. and game specific optimizations. Because they're comparing it to uh, uh, this says the A380 Photon has four display connectors, three yeah, display so ports, better than the 6400. So, yeah, in display <laughs> outputs, yes, that is an upgrade over the RX 6400. But will it have better performance than the 6400? Will it have better driver no. support than the 6400? So, no. Right. No, it's, it's going to be a proof of concept. You know, I was this really... is just to get people, system builders, driver programmers, game designers, used to the idea that, oh, player three has entered the game, maybe. Right. And so it'll be Battle Mage before they even make a shot at, you know, even saying, no, it's it, we made this to compete sort of against AMD and NVIDIA. This one is just sort of, see, we did it. Let's get small. Intel 4 process node. Detailed by Ryan Smith at Anontech.com. So it's 4 nanometer? Well, okay, it's complicated. Eh. It's <laughs> Intel 4. Look, eh. 4 is smaller than 7. But you know what? I, I do appreciate this. You can look at this... Uh, photography here this uh i don't know is this x-ray what is this electron microscope okay so ieee -E -E, or ieee -E, is having their annual vlsi symposium it's a big industry event and intel is showing off their first process to incorporate euv moving past as he writes their troubled 10 nanometer node because honestly intel 7 is still a nanometer but they're moving <laughs> past it to seven nanometer finally but now it's called four previously referred to as seven nanometer intel four 20 so percent performance per watt gain full use of euv lithography oh, this is all old uh let me actually get to the new stuff okay physical parameters of intel four this is where we actually get some kind of concrete evidence that it is not just marketing it is actually a smaller process tech. The fin pitch is down from 34 to 30 nanometers. The contact... A, a reduction of four. It's not a reduction of four, is it? The change... <laughs> Here's the weird thing. It's point. It's 88% of oh, the see. previous yeah, value. So if you multiply 34 by 0.8, I get it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about like a 2x reduction, but, you know, four isn't half of seven. That would be three and a half. And who's going to produce something at three and a half nanometers, really? Plus, this is seven. And we're comparing it to 10, which is called seven, but this is seven called four. But if you look at it, everything from library height to fin pitch is significantly smaller. And smaller is better. Smaller is keeping Moore's Law alive, <laughs> which means that Moore's Law is dead is going to have to change their YouTube screen name, I guess. Mm. Probably not, though. So the library height, everything. I don't, I'm not going to pretend to understand. Ryan Smith goes into great detail, and our process tech guy is not here this week. So I know we miss him. I'm just the host. I'm just the idiot who takes pictures and hosts the podcast every week. Intel used a lot of words, some of which might not mean what you think they do, and some of which might not turn out to be as accurate as was intended. But They're it's definitely a four, and there will be a three soon. So and don't mention plus 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 plus. I saw twenty angstroms on the uh, on the development chart. Mm -hmm. It's on the roadmap. Yep. So the important takeaways here are that they are targeting at least two x density scaling and twenty percent improved performance. Now, I if that's IPC, that's huge. But I don't know if that's just because they're going to be able to incorporate more cores. Or, I don't know. They're, they will eventually have to join the chiplet revolution, I'm sure, <laughs> at <laughs> they, some point. Yes, yes, they will. Let's pause here for a word from this week's podcast sponsor. 
As the sun comes out and small businesses are back in business, LinkedIn Jobs makes it easier to grow your team. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the people you want to interview faster and now for free. For myself, using LinkedIn Jobs has worked in the past and connected me with qualified people and some of the best hiring organizations. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of now over 810 million people. Then add your job in the purple hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Now your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and then hire. This is why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hiring hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash pcper. That's linkedin.com slash pcper to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. We're back and we're going to talk about Ryzen stuttering. Well, we've talked about this before. I think we've talked about this two or three times in recent memory, but it's a new article published on Times Hardware a day ago and most... Almost all AM4 motherboards already have the microcode update, writes Aaron Klotz. So here we are, quoting the article. It's now June of 2022. AMD's new Agisa 1207 microcode in most AM4 motherboards. And it includes fixes for the FTPM stuttering bug. It includes full Ryzen 5000 series support and older AM4 motherboards. Including three hundred, including three hundred series motherboards, which yep. I thought was interesting. If it's got that TPM chip on it, yep. Right. This also addresses some of the early, uh, or they talk about the USB issues that. Yeah, we've that's been at. allegedly fixed since the GSO one dot two dot zero dot two. And this means a lot for those dozens of people using Windows eleven. There well, that was hundreds, the thing. if not even thousand <laughs> of people using Windows eleven right now. <laughs> Well, that's why they got the sample size large enough to be able to fix the issue. All right. Let's just plow right through the next topic. Microsoft is ending support for Internet Explorer for Windows 10. I'll drink to that. 15. Uh, I, I will almost send them a card. Jeremy, how do you feel about this? Oh, no, uh, uh, well, I work for people that are in denial of this and still haven't ported over some <laughs> major systems to anything that is compatible with something other than Internet Explorer, but they kind of don't have a choice now unless they're going to go with the argument, that, well, it's not supported anymore, so no one's going to try and hack it because, well, it's out of date. Like, mm-hmm. No, they're just going to keep going just like Internet Explorer. It's, 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 it's never going to die. It's just going to keep going. It's, it's a bloody zombie. I love the idea, though, because it needs to go. I mean, I'm still going to use Credge to download a real browser, but at least IE is gone. Sort I of. personally fought IE quirks for 10 years of oh. web development some time ago, and it sucked. It really well, the, sucked. The worst thing is that the, the, you fight those, bad taste in them. I, yeah. and they find a way to fix it. Which breaks it on every other browser in existence, including Netscape <sighs> Navigator somehow. And nah, so we'll, there we'll only work on IE 11 ish or mm-hmm. IE 8 or 9 or 10 or uh, yeah, it's literally you had to break stuff in a certain way so that it would work on Internet Explorer, which would stop it from working properly on anything else. And this has been our lives for what, 37 years, something like that. No, that's this is the 27th anniversary 27. of uh, okay, yeah, yeah. of of IE. Uh, I'm I'm super happy that it is dying. Unfortunately, we may still have to live with the IE compatibility modes uh, found in Windows editions of Credge. Yeah. So what are you going to do? Well, and since uh, Windows still bases a lot of their Internet security settings off of Internet Explorer, what are they going to do? Moving on from Internet Explorer. Yeah, uh, Jeremy. Sorry, Jeremy. R-I-P-I-E. Stray. You gotta explain. <laughs> what is explain Stray? It's the, oh, is this really a cat? Actually, this is this could be good. All right, yes, let's start over this again. is a cat simulator in some sort of dystopic cyberpunk future where the world's populated by robots. <laughs> uh, some of which from the trailer seem to like a cats and some that 
yeah, that's not a good idea to let them know you're around. So it'll be a stealthy, jumpy thing. Uh, it does. The cat doesn't have any uh, thumbs, but it does seem to have a backpack. <laughs> so I suspect there will be a little bit of fetching going on, even though that's, you know, not a cat's job. That's a, a dog's job. But it, it looks like some of the visuals in the teaser trailer uh, at RPS are really neat looking. Like it looks like it's a, a sort of a different take on uh, third person stealth. So yeah, you're, you're third person just sort of being a cat. And I mean, who doesn't want to be a cat? It's very much the robots, a cat simulator. The robots are running away from the cat. Not all of them. There's some people you can talk to, perhaps. Not that you can talk, but this is a sort of neat thing. And, and yes, of course he's knocking the bottles over because it's a cat. The uh, lighting this looks, looks very good. Entertaining. The it in- looks a little different. Interiors and like this one right here is a little flatter, but some of those environments, the the lighting, because of course the PS5 is capable of some ray trace lighting effects. Yes. Yeah. And it'll yeah. be dropping on Steam the same time. But oh, as okay. I say, some robots not so fan fond of the kitties. This would be the best benchmark moving forward. Yeah, like look at this. This just looks stupid. Like you've got a giant tree to climb. And then they lie to us because well it's a trailer. I just want to I just want to have it in every review. Like cat simulator. Yeah. Uh, and it'll be out before Goat Simulator 3, so FPS. it'll tide you over. Sticking to Rock, Paper, Shotgun, let's look at another. Well, this is a confirmation that Fallout 5 is coming after The Elder Scrolls 6. Yes. And and after Starfield, which they're currently, oh. they've been working on for like six or seven years now. And we're totally going to release. Good. Well, I mean, that, that looks fairly close, I think. I mean, closer than obviously, you know, Fallout 5 will be, but I just hope this isn't a Fallout 76 kind of carry on. I hope it's more like a sequel to Fallout 4 more. I'm not sure that even Bethesda might have been able to have learned their lesson out of Fallout 76. I'd like to think so. Well, apparently they're doing more DLC to go back to the pit again, for which was the place everyone hated the most. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. They said um, last week that uh, Starfield was 12 months out, which means 14 to 16 probably would be my guess. Years? Uh, <laughs> months. <laughs> I, I, I hope. But, uh, so they've been working on Starfield for seven years, and they've probably got yeah. a little over a year left is what you're saying, what you're saying before we see it in first it's iteration. Delayed. Because delaying <laughs> games is trending. Well, yeah. They're saying 12 well, months. I think Kent is saying 14 to 16. On, you know, just yeah, count the, on the, it, something like that. There'll be a new engine <laughs> release, and they realize that they're going to have to port the game over to the new engine because otherwise it wouldn't do it justice. And uh, right. yeah. Oh, or maybe a new GPU or two or three. Maybe Cyberpunk has finally convinced uh, developers that it is worth postponing a game until it's actually ready. Instead you said that with a straight face. I'm amazed. Hey, if. If these uh, if these other games are any guide, don't look for Fallout Five anytime in the next five plus years. You know, it's probably going to twenty twenty six. Don't be. look for yeah. Elder Scrolls Six anytime in the next five or six years. They're not even going to start Fallout go. Five until after that. So it's t- it's ten years away. Moving on, if you buy an AMD GPU, guess what? <gasps> you get up to three free games. And look at the titles. Look at the quality of these titles. Oh, okay. Well, some, what else? I mean, okay. Saints Row. Well, you've heard of one of them. Sniper Elite 5. Mm-hmm. That's and the then something called Forspoken. Never heard of it. It's Forsp- totally not Monster Forsp- Hunter. It's totally not uh, uh, Final Fantasy. It's Raise the Game. Forspoken's Sorry, release date is supposed to be in October. Oh, um, yeah. I'm actually sort of looking forward to it. it one of the things that it, it is appealing is it looks like an open world RPG. Most open world RPGs that I've encountered that deal with a fantasy aspect, you're always the warrior. You're always Geralt of Rivia or you know, something along those lines um, or someone in an Assassin's Creed. Um this it, you're playing the mage and some of the magic powers just look fantastic. Yeah. Um, 
So I'm, I'm sort of looking forward to it, but again, it's still five, uh, four months away. So, um, I'm not holding my breath. I'll wait and see what, uh, what kind of reviews it gets. Well, it's Square Enix, so there'll be a huge amount of very positive ones and some honest ones. Not that I hate all of Square Enix's games. Some of them have been really good, but this one is interesting, and apparently she just had a really, really crappy birthday present. It was high. <laughs> You've been teleported into a new world. Looks uh, like typical ultra-high-quality Square Enix uh, cutscenes, that's for sure. Or is this in-engine, I wonder? That's yeah, it's cinematic wow. in engine, I believe. Yeah, because the huh. I Amazing. having played a lot of Final yeah. Fantasy VII remake on the PS5, it is possible Was that to luminous? get very, very, very good. I don't know. I don't know what the uh, engine is because that's what they're using for this one. So it could be. In shocking news, Samsung has been caught cheating in benchmarks. I know this is <laughs> no, to believe. no TV benchmarks, no less. Really? So they've been caught cheating by... Where is this? This is from Flat Panels HD. Samsung has been caught cheating by designing its TVs to recognize and react to test patterns used by reviewers. Fantastic. You know what? This, this Everything makes, old is new again. This makes a lot of sense. Because what they're demonstrating here is that Samsung was keying on the size of the window that was being put on the screen, if it was at 10% and had a few other characteristics, then it knew it was being tested and changed things like response, uh, brightness, knit output, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So they sort of sub subverted the, the cheat by reducing the test window to 9% of the screen. And then they were able to, to see the difference. And that's why that slider bar was there. So showing you that people who go to ratings.com and, base their buying decisions on that and then they get the TV and hmm. but my favorite part about the whole thing is Samsung's reply is just it's brilliant oh right yeah talk about this this is okay. hysterical to provide a more dynamic viewing experience for the consumers Samsung will provide a software update that ensures consistent brightness of HDR contents across a wider range of window size beyond the industry standard Oh, so you caught us at that one window size. Okay, well, we're going to provide an update so you can't catch us at any window size. Yeah, they're basically going to say, we're sorry that you caught us. We will cheat better next time. Yeah, yeah we're, That's we're one just going to make sure that you can't that. catch us. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the um, the Volkswagen scandal or the and, and others, the Dieselgate sort of <laughs> thing, where they knew they were on the dyno and being tested, and they changed their emissions category or mm -hmm. um, way that they were being uh, ignited and all that so that they had lower emissions. Yeah. Reminds me but of that, don't worry, in the way. future, we'll make it even harder for you to catch that we're changing the emissions. Mm. Pac-Man targets the new M1 chip. I hear this is bad. I wonder if uh, they're going to be able to patch this. Ouch. This doesn't look good. Oh, you've, you, I posted this for you, Brett. I figured you'd know oh, about it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, I hadn't you're, seen you're this. You're so very welcome. So, I had yeah, not you seen know it. the uh, M1 uh, pointer authentic authentication, which is built in so that mm -hmm. even if someone was to even get into your system and just slightly modify <laughs> a memory reference, it would totally be stopped. It, it would be it would be just just shoot away by the pointer yes. protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, guess what? Uh oh, it's not only that. It's so these guys, uh, these researchers figured out a way to get around the brute force memory mapping. Whereas before, <laughs> you know, if you start feeding in, you know, weird memory to, tr to try and figure out where certain commands are sitting in memory, it would yeah. eventually crash the program or at least kick you out. Yeah, no. Um, this was all these, supposed these to be taken care of with address, rand uh, address uh, randomization. That was supposed to be a whole big deal. That was supposed to hide these things so you could never find them. It took them under three minutes to guess a proper value for a 16-bit pack and Oof. construct the actual hijacking attack. And it's pretty much, we're, we're thinking hardware. Now, Apple's pretty cagey about what's on their chips, so we don't know for sure. But yeah, this could well be a flaw in the hardware itself, or at least require some major uh, firmware upgrades because the uh, pointer authentication code is like 
pretty much heart of the whole memory addressing in in the uh, well in most ships, but in, in the M1 as well. So yeah, it's it's not good, and it's it's not even just that you can do it; it's that you can do it to any of them, and they won't even know that you're trying until you've managed to do it, and then inject a little mm-hmm. bit of code, and next thing you know, well, Bob's your uncle. Yeah, now, this sounds really bad. Yeah, it's it's not good, but I don't have to worry because, well, actually, there's one M1 coming into the company soon, I think. Now, hopefully, the M2 won't be so bad. Maybe they'll fix it for the M2. They've, they've already that released the, the M2. Thing. It's already done. It's already baked. The uh, yeah, the see. machine ship in a few days, I think. I think the order window and the ship window are very, very soon, like within a week. Within Naturally, you would be familiar with this. Like you've been checking and refreshing the page over and over again. Let's pause here for a word from another podcast sponsor this week. Hey, have you heard of Collide yet? Collide sends employees important, timely, and relevant security recommendations for their Linux, Mac, or Windows devices right inside Slack. And if you're like many organizations, you know you can reach your employees on Slack. Collide is perfect for organizations that care deeply about compliance and security, but don't want to get there by locking down devices to the point where they become unusable. Instead of frustrating your employees, Collide educates them about security and device management while directing them to fix important issues. Visit collide.com slash PC per to check this out and sign up today. That's K O L I D E dot com slash PC per. Use your email and get a free Collide gift bundle after trial activation. At Collide, we know that end users are IT admins' most significant untapped resource and their key to solving the most challenging to fix security issues, including instructing developers to set passphrases on unencrypted SSH keys, finding plain text two factor backup codes, and teaching end users how to store them securely, and convincing employees to uninstall those evil browser extensions that may even sell their browser history. These are just some of the many use cases not solved by locking down devices. You can try Collide with all of its features on an unlimited number of devices for free for 14 days with no credit card required. Try it out at collide.com slash PC per. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash PC per. We're back and it's review time. It's another week, another Jeremy review, but it's a little bit different this time. Look at this. Gaming headset. Hold on, we have uh, the gaming headset in person. Well, I think it's like the third gaming headset I've done recently. Oh, all right. Really? But this one's wired. Not that I brought the wires with me, because, well, you already saw it on a podcast once. So this is uh, the Drop X, brought to you by Sennheiser, which Mm. will become very important because of what it actually is. So in, in one sense... The, the PC38X is a move along. Uh, it's, it's an upgrade from the PC37X, which was uh, the original one. But the thing is that these are done by Sennheiser. So literally the same drivers that sit in the GSP500 and 600s are in this. So yeah, drop is just Sennheiser's gaming side. Uh, just like uh, their, their high end. What was the, what do they call it for you? Sebastian, uh, should be right there. Epos. Yeah. Right. Epos is sort of their, their higher end, uh, audiophile stuff. It's still Sennheiser and it makes, you know, very little difference as to what's inside the headset. It's just more what it looks like and, uh, you know, how it was designed. So this one is very, if you open it up in a new tab, it's much bigger. Uh, this one's specifically designed to be a gaming headset. So they've made it a little lighter. Uh, it's got open backs, whereas most of the Sennheisers you run into have the closed backs. And they've made it very puffy. And then you can see there that that's significantly more padding than you would normally find uh, on a Sennheiser. It's lighter, uh, partly because of the open back, partly because of the materials they use to construct it. There's a lot of plastic. There's not really much metal at all. And the big thing is that they've angled the drivers. Now, they say that this gives you better positional accuracy when you're listening to a stereo headset so that you've got a better idea whether things are coming left or right or, you know, preferably moving from left to right without having to invest in a 5.1 system or a virtual 5.1, which, as we all know, works wonderfully. So, yeah, I tried to these out. And, I mean, honestly, it doesn't hurt. 
To have angled drivers does not hurt. I honestly don't know that it helps much. I, I tried it in a couple of different games, and I mean, th there were some. Metro uh, Exodus was downright freaking creepy, partly because of the, the tone of the Sennheiser, which, you know, it, Sebastian, you've described it as a this equalizer smile with a little bit more mid-range to it than normal. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what you get. But the thing is that most of the creepy crawlies that you're worried about are not sitting in the mid range. They're either, you know, higher notes or they're, they're higher tones or they're lower tones. And so there were some games where the environmental noises, the wind, the, the trees moving in that was definitely less emphasized than things moving around. So for that, it was interesting. Uh, Hellblade Senwa's Sacrifice, I think these were made for. Holy crap, that was impressive. Uh, I still haven't finished the game. I've just made it a little bit through. But it, it, part of the idea of it is that, you know, it's trying to emulate a psychosis by, you know, having you completely surrounded by voices in your head. And these things do an insanely good job. Uh, Generation Zero and a couple of the more laid back sort of more stealth types. Yeah. I don't know, but for like fast paced shooters and for stuff that, you know, has really worked hard on making their audio intense, they're really good. And at, uh, about $140, uh, I think they're supposed to retail for 180. I've literally never seen them for that. Uh, they've always been going for about 140 us significantly cheaper than if you were going to do with a 5.1 or a 7.1. So yeah, I, I don't, have really much bad to say about them. Uh, listening to music on it, it was quite good. Uh, I, I tried uh, some Carl Orff and that didn't work out too well. I wouldn't do it if you like uh, opera or orchestral stuff, but harder stuff, yeah, very nice. Uh, if you've if you know you've got a singer on the high and a lot of bass, it, it sounds quite impressive. The, the design is dead simple. Uh, I mean, the, the volume, which uh, you can sort of, it's just it's a limited spin, so you can't crank it to the, the maximum, but uh, it does, it's also not going to break or snap off. And yeah, that, that would be them there. And it comes with two cables. Uh, so if you're going to do the split uh, because you want it plugged into the back of your PC, well, it's about uh, two and a half meters. So it's, it's going to fit back there, no problem at all. The single one for your cell phone or whatever is only about one and a half meters, so call it five feet, which is perhaps you'll, perhaps just a little bit too long for some people, but you know, also not bad enough. You're going to be decapitating yourself on everything you walk by the microphone. Uh, it's an electric. So that's kind of unusual for Sennheiser. They don't usually tend to go that way. And here you go. Josh is away. So you get my kitty. Uh, it, again, it's, you, you would have heard it on this podcast, I think, three weeks ago. It's not up for production value, but for squad-based shooters where you're communicating with each other, it'd be brilliant. It's clear. It's got noise reduction. So even if you've got, you know, a, an AC unit next to you, you're probably not going to hear it too badly. So, you know, overall, for the price, not bad. If you're an audiophile or you really hate open backs... Yeah, I don't know if I could say it, but yeah, overall, not bad at all. Sennheiser's doing some good stuff still. What was the what was the retail on those? What's the price on those again? Well, they're they're supposed to be about uh, one seventy, but literally oh. everywhere is selling them for one forty or less. The whole thing about I mean, angle they're not drivers. the only ones that have the angled drivers, but they're the first time I run into, and I. Yeah, the best I can say is it doesn't make it worse. The theory I'd heard about them and what I had perceived when I've tested them is that if they're not flat against your ears and they're angled slightly, it gives you a little bit more of an in-room speaker kind of effect. It does Very much slightly so. alter the sound stage a little bit. And then if you combine it with an open back, it can you can almost fool yourself into thinking that you're sitting there listening to monitors, depending on the quality of the headphone and stuff. It's not really wide so much as it is um, a little bit more distant. Yeah, so, and the ear cups on this are ginormous. Which is good. Like I like it when it goes all the way around. You. 
with yeah. the space. Mm -hmm. But like, say, uh, the opening to Pink Floyd's Money was freaking brilliant. Right, where you're getting the, the cash register and the sounds mm -hmm. going, and they're just bouncing mm -hmm. back and forth and back and forth. Yeah, absolutely brilliant for this. It, it was, you know, just wonderfully to hear. Uh, on the run, yeah, sort of worked. Not quite as good. Uh, sober was good just because, I mean, it emphasizes the bass and was quite nice. Uh, yeah, someone asked, uh, it was a Within Temptation that I tried, and it was, yeah, it's it's there. Dark Enemy might have worked better if she gets a little bit higher up. Let's move on to Picks of the Week. And Jeremy is going to get us started this time. Well, and to be perfectly honest, uh, Al popped this up and said it was his pick of the week. And well, he's not on the show. So guess what? It's my pick of the week. So you might remember the Floppatron 1.0. He, he learned how to play various songs on uh, a few minutes later. on ancient computer hardware wow. and now he's going to do the entrance of the gladiators on oh my goodness yes and he's moved up so like he's got 3d printed psu covers um he's got three emergency stop buttons which is probably a good idea so four flatbed scanners, 16 hard drives. There we go. So yeah, he's got a mini gateway going and check it out. It's essentially an orchestra made out of 512 floppy disk drives, 16 hard drives, four scanners, a ridiculous amount of control cards, uh, a MIDI interface. Very impressive. And he's been doing this. The first one came out in 2011. So it's, this has been a work in progress for quite a long time. And it's insane. Who's next? Up? That's me. It's me. All right, Brett, Brett, this you're is next. A very reason this is a very reasonably priced Wi-Fi device that uh, operates in one of three different exciting modes. This is a Wi-Fi extender that probably does exactly what you think that it would do, pick up a Wi-Fi signal and rebroadcast it again to a variety of other devices. But it will also do essentially the inverse. And it will take a device that only has a hardwired um, Ethernet cable and Wi-Fi enable that. So you could cable this to a television or some other Blu-ray or whatever that may have only a uh, Ethernet cable and make it Wi-Fi enabled. So that that's actually pretty cool. The other thing it will do is it'll take a um, an Ethernet line, you know, a hardwired line, and turn it into a Wi-Fi broadcast as well. So it essentially operates either as a Wi-Fi extender, a uh, a Wi-Fi broadcaster from or Wi-Fi repeater, I should say, based upon an incoming Wi-Fi signal. A, uh, a, wi an ex a network extender over Wi-Fi uh, based upon um, an incoming Ethernet uh, line. Or you could turn a device that only has Ethernet into something that's Wi-Fi enabled. It's kind of a cool little device for 33 bucks. Kent, your pick. This is a uh, limited deal, although they don't show an expiration on it, so I'm not sure how long it's going to last. But um, this is a WD Red NAS drive. This uses uh, CMR recording and not shingled recording. Yes. Um, so it's uh, it's just a Red plus eight terabyte drive for NAS use. Um, normally these are you know retail is two thirty nine. Uh, Newegg has them for one eighty nine ninety nine. But there is a forty dollar off promo code coupon that takes it down to $149.99. Um, and that's about the price that people were buying up the uh, Western Digital external docks and shucking the drives out of them for. So um, yeah, getting, that's a good price even full, for that. Like $149 yeah. for an easy store would have been a good deal. Oh, yeah. So $149 for some of these. If you need some more storage in your NAS, jump my pick this week 
is something what? that I have been testing graphics cards the last few days, and I've completely become out of touch with current pricing because the stuff was unavailable for so long. And then when stock became available again, pricing, I don't think it's stabilized yet, but it has been dropping pretty rapidly. And then we had kind of a regression where it seemed like maybe prices were kind of either stagnant or even going up slightly. But It's gone from instant tears and tantrums to just sort of a general malaise and depression. Yes. That's a good way of putting it. But uh, if you're actually looking for a graphics card and you're willing to spend what has become mid-range price, which is like 300 to $400, and entry level is 200 now. Well, if you have that kind of money and you're looking for something with really good performance, I've been testing a RTX 3050. There's nothing wrong with this card, but an RTX 3050 GPU is not as powerful as a Radeon RX 6600 XT is. What? And the 3050 is 359. And I think the cheapest one I saw was like 329. And this XFX Speedster Swift 210 6600 XT is 359. Same price as the 3050 I'm currently finishing up the review on. But, you know, it's fast. Faster. Because NVIDIA cards haven't really dropped at the same rate that the AMD cards have. AMD ones were a little bit more available and a little bit more affordable anyway throughout the the, the dark times because AMD would actually sell them at MSRP directly when you could find them. And I like to go to Best Buy from time to time to look for graphics cards because they don't sell things for any kind of a markup. It's not like market price. It's just MSRP. So... Anyway, it's in stock. I can actually add it to my cart online and buy it, and it'll be shipped to me. Well, we have come to the end of another PC Perspective podcast. We want to thank you for listening, watching, um, participating in the chat if you were with us during our difficult live stream, riddled with technical glitches and other problems. I blame Josh. If Josh was here, he's like the glue that holds the whole thing together. It didn't even feel right. Like The intro felt off. There was no proper burger that we did have a a stand-in burger right, this come week, on that was a pretty good burger it was a, it was a really good burger and honestly the, the josh the josh style innuendo we sort of kind of missed out on that i miss him losing his breath Pete red laughing at one of his own jokes 